This episode contains adult themes and may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to Catholic Break Conversations, a podcast about embracing God's standard for sexuality. I'm your host, Brady Cohn, and once again joining me is Josh Klein from Free Thinking Ministries. How's it going today, Josh? It's great. Good. Yeah. I have my coffee in front of me, and so I am good to go. So this is about my fourth round today. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you're not you a alert. coffee drinker. Not a coffee drinker. No. So so what what keeps you going? The Holy Spirit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. Sleep. No, I drink too much pop. That's my problem. Oh, that's, that's your yeah. weakness. Yeah. I yep. see. <laughs> cool. Well, we are so glad that you're joining us today. Make sure you check out calibrateministries.com, freethinkingministries.com. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and if you rather listen to your podcast on apps, find us on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all the places around the interwebs where you listen to your favorite podcast, Calibrate Conversations. All right. So today we are talking about a little bit of a follow-up from last week. Last week, we talked about homosexuality and we kept getting off track a little bit because we can't handle the topic of homosexuality without talking about just biblical sexuality and marriage in general. And that's what I do when I go to churches a lot. They want me to come and talk about homosexuality, which I do because that's, that's my background. Uh, but we can't handle this topic without building a vision for marriage. And so we're going to talk about today, the war on marriage in our culture. And you've done uh, some extensive work on this. I really appreciate some of your blog posts, your own podcast. Yeah. And so people should check that out. But the war on marriage, uh, it's, it's really staggering when we look in our culture to see how we no longer value marriage. Sometimes we despise marriage. And where where is that coming from? What are some of your initial thoughts there? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things to recognize is that the war on marriage is not new. Uh, in fact, marriage as the institution that we understand it from a Judeo-Christian perspective um, is actually fairly new in human history uh, as far as as far as uh, how our culture has built around it. Uh, but the war on marriage is not new. You, you, we can we can bring it back to even. Uh, I mean, you can bring it back to ancient Greece, but if we fast forward a little bit more. We can bring it back to Karl Marx, who really had a vendetta against the nuclear family. He wanted to break up the nuclear family in order to in order to usher along the revolution. Uh, you you couldn't you couldn't revolt against uh, the the bourgeoisie. Uh, if you were too intent on taking care of your kids, because you need that work, you need the paycheck. And so one of his one of his letters with Frederick Engels, he talks about dismantling the institution of marriage. And we've actually seen that carry forward throughout history and in the American culture recently uh, to to say Black Lives Matter, one of their however you feel about the organization, one of their key doctrines in their what we believe was we believe in the dismantling of the nuclear family it's not on the website anymore but it was and the reason for that is because they they said that they were trained marxists so it does come from this marxist thought of if we can destroy the family we can then uh, usher in a revolution Mm -hmm. um apart from that our cultures so so that's one aspect politically so it's a political and a cultural conversation politically that's an aspect and then the cultural conversation is when we started to remove sex from a marriage heterosexual marriage expectation lifestyle and we started to enter in things like no-fault divorce in the 1970s, uh, and before that even the idea that there could be a two-income household now because we now have, we have ways to prevent pregnancy. We have, we have uh, ways to, to avoid unwanted pregnancies, right? And uh, that birth control that was brought in helped us to take sex away from the marriage relationship. And so now with then no fault divorce comes in because, well, maybe somebody is no longer attracted to their partner and it becomes this contractual thing. Yes. And 
goes from being a covenant to just a business contract. Like, yeah. what can you provide for me right now? So long as we're 50, 50, we're good. But as soon as I see someone else that catches my eye, we're, we're not good. And Jesus actually speaks to this in the new Testament. He says, uh, you should not divorce your wife for any reason apart from infidelity or unfaithfulness. And there's a way to nuance those terms as far as what unfaithfulness actually yes, looks that, like. That's complicated. Yeah. But the idea is that our culture moves that way for a variety of reasons. And for a long time, we saw it on what we'd call the, the political or the social left. Uh, but because of the way our culture has moved in the court system and stuff, we actually see that from the right now as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this, I don't know if you're the acronym M MGTOW. It's men going their own way. That's, oh, wow. Yeah, that's, I hadn't heard that. That's what they say. And so they say, well, I'm just going to be single because there's no point to getting married because I'm just going to be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to go my own way. And the ubiquitous use of pornography, now you can find your sexual gratification on a screen uh, instead of in a marriage relationship. And so all of that <laughs> plays into yes. the dismantling of marriage in our current cultural context. And so, yeah, some of the observations I see is that we've given up on marriage, and men especially see that society is kind of working against them. Mm -hmm. uh, society has not valued men. Men are just uh, something to be tolerated and not something to value. Um, and then our court systems work against men, you know, with family structure and divorce and uh and so it feel I heard someone say the other day it feels like men go into the slaughterhouse by getting mm. married, and it's so tragic that that is our understanding of marriage is that um, uh, it's just going to obliterate you. So why why even try? And we see that like I said, it started out with the the political and ideological left. Yeah, but I see it so much on the right now too on um, uh, this culture of. Um, marriage is uh, is is not even worth trying, and it's just oppressive. Uh, and and we've seen women claim marriage was oppressive because men are oppressing them. But then now we see this response of men are just kind of feel like they're taken advantage of, mm -hmm. used, put down, uh, emasculated, and, and just uh, um, feel like it's it's not worth it anymore of even trying. Yeah, and so one of the one of the common refrains from that is to say that well, if I get married now, my marriage might be good for ten years, uh, but if I'm a business person and I've made all this money, and then my wife decides to leave me, and then the court system says she gets to take the kids and she gets to take half my income, so it's it's too much of a risk. That's mm -hmm. that's kind of the word that's used yeah. is, is marriage too is too risky for men. Uh, and then there will be some women that say, well, marriage is too risky for women because of the levels of abuse that happen, um, the levels of infidelity. Uh, so so it's it's trying to mitigate risk by not participating in the institution at all. And I think that that is an incorrect prescription for the Absolutely. problem. Absolutely. So there is an actual problem. Yeah. Uh, but then culture solution is obviously wrong. Um, one One place where I see this playing out that I think is really intriguing is the language that we use. And I, it, I always cringe when I see this, I see people referring to their partner yeah. all the time. And so I'm in a lot of dad groups online and people will ask questions. Maybe it's about finances, about raising the kids and they always refer to my partner. Mm -hmm. And so they don't designate whether this is a girlfriend or a wife or a fiance. It's like, I can't give you a, a, a solid response because it depends on what your relationship is. What if you have a covenant with this woman, but to a culture that's irrelevant, we just want a partner for companionship yep. uh, for what they can do for me right now without the constraints and commitment to marriage. And I think it's interesting that many of the men I see just using the word partner, they are in a heterosexual marriage, mm -hmm. uh, but the term marriage is irrelevant to them. It's just a, a domestic partnership for yeah. this moment in life. And I responded kind of snarky the other night. Uh, someone was asking question, a question about like, well, my partner is treating my kids this way. Uh, and I don't really like it. It's like, 
So are you talking about a wife, a girlfriend, a fiance, your business partner, your <laughs> lab partner in class in a school at school? It's like, what kind of partner are you talking about? Mm. Because that dictates so much on what you should be expecting of them on how they treat your kids and how this just plays out in your life. And so we've erased mm. all those classifications mm. because we think that marriage is irrelevant and it's just about having a domestic partnership. At Calibrate Ministries, we have an entire ministry just for parents of LGBTQ kids because we want to be able to shepherd your hearts and encourage you and pray for you and your family as you navigate these situations. So just go to CalibrateMinistries.com and fill out the contact form, and I'd love to be in touch with you about how you can be involved in that ministry. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to kind of put it this way, too, is your spouse should be your partner, but Absolutely. that should not be all your spouse is. And uh, your girlfriend is not your partner. It's your girlfriend. You haven't agreed to anything yet. You have no obligation to each other except for treating each other well and you know, yeah, that, that sort of absolutely. thing. And, and I think the use of the word partner— Sometimes it's, you know, there's semantic drift in our culture and you just start to use words without realizing the implications. And so I think a lot of men and women start to use that word without even re recognizing that the implications of using that term to refer to your husband or your wife specifically is actually to depersonalize the relationship and corporatize it. Mm. And so now it becomes uh, we're, we're a partnership. It's 50-50. It's give and take. Uh, whereas in, in biblical Christianity, where, where I, I put, plant my flag, uh, the partnership is actually the two becoming one flesh. Uh, we're, we're not just partners. We're covenantally bound together. Mm -hmm. So what affects my wife affects me, and what affects me affects her. So she's not just some partner I'm going through life with. She is my flesh, and I need to take care of her as such. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so we have to be careful and not, um, we need to understand what, where our culture is at, but not buy into, uh, the cultural prescription for these problems within marriage. And so just in that aspect, it's like, like I encourage men to like define things. Well, it's like, this is my wife. Like, mm -hmm. this isn't just a partner. This is my wife. And that has a meaning to it that is probably beyond, it is much beyond how our culture defines it, but we need to understand the biblical meaning and take that seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And our culture has done a, 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 the job of wanting to redefine what marriage is. So no fault to force marriage is redefined to basically just that partnership because you can leave at any time, no matter what, if it's anyone's fault. So in a covenantal relationship, you can't just leave whenever you want. There's a covenant that as long as it's unbroken means you're supposed to remain united. Uh, and then in 2014, we redefine marriage again and, and words have meanings, right? And so in 2014 with Obergefell, uh, we redefine marriage as being same sex unions as well. And that's not me saying that culturally I want everyone to be uh, Christianized. I'm saying the word marriage and the word uh, the word married have actual definitions historically, also biblically, uh, that we're redefining and we're actually losing the institution because of that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to know that this is an institution created by God. Yes. And so that's why marriage is so important. It's it's not just uh, a side note in our life or it's like it's like it's it's instituted by God. It's the foundation so it's it found so foundational to our humanity and to our witness and to our family structure and to human flourishing and what God created for in a picture of the gospel. It is so extremely foundational to who we are. And we are trying to redefine that. So then we have to fight through as the church. How do we respond to culture? Not just respond, but how do we um, engage with culture? How do we do marriage well with inside the church, regardless of what culture is doing? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where a lot of Christians get so frustrated and discouraged, even though they shouldn't, 
is that just because culture is doing this doesn't mean that you have to. Mm. It's like you can and should be a model of biblical marriage. Like culture doesn't control you. Culture doesn't have to control your kids. Uh, that's why we disciple our kids on what biblical marriage is and what biblical sexuality is. Yeah, like you don't have to be discouraged by culture because we don't have to live by culture. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's why I I push back against the narrative that um, men in particular shouldn't participate in marriage because it's too risky. Uh Yes, sure, it is risky, um, but marriage has always been risky, even from when it was instituted. I mean, the the risk that Adam and Eve, uh, and they end up falling into this trap where Adam doesn't play his role, and then mm-hmm. Eve supplants that, that leadership that God gave him and negotiates with the serpent, and all of a sudden we're a fallen race, right? But God recognized it's not good for man to be alone. He needs a helpmate. Uh, And that's not to say that people can't live fulfilling lives as single people. We also see that in Scripture. Jesus was single. um, Absolutely. And Paul was single. So we need need a better theology of marriage, but we also need a better theology of singleness. Yes. And for singles to thrive within the church, we need a better theology of singleness and marriage. Because so many times we idolize marriage, we find our hope in marriage, we think that singleness is a disease and the only Mm. cure for it is marriage. And then marriage comes in that we have all kinds of other problems. And so, so we really need a better theology of marriage with inside the church. Yeah, absolutely. And so, especially for those, those single people like to, to feel cared for and, and, and love to take, to, to be able to do well in, in, in life and in discipleship uh, to say that, well, I don't think scripture mandates marriage for, for individuals. You don't have to go get married. Yes. I do think scripture, reveres marriage and says that it is a worthwhile endeavor and it is the picture of Christ in the church and the church ought to reflect that. So the church has work to do on this front, regardless of what the culture is doing. Yes. You know, I would like to point out that uh, the culture says that biblical masculinity, that biblical marriage is harmful to people. Mm-hmm. And I, I've been reading a book that I, so far I really recommend, I probably shouldn't recommend it till I get to the end of it. Uh, but uh, The Toxic War on Masculinity by Nancy Piercy just came out recently. Yeah, I've heard of it. And so far it is absolutely intriguing on the work that she's done on the history of masculinity and how our culture is against it and how masculinity has been used over time and has changed over time. And uh, she she did a lot of research and found that um, people in ma- in Christian marriages where they were actually Christian going to church regularly have healthier, happier marriages and lives than non-Christians. And society says that it's actually uh, the same, that being Christian doesn't make marriage any better. But she, the research actually breaks it down between people who call themselves Christians but yeah. aren't engaged in actual um, Christian community or regular fellowship versus Christians who uh, are actually regularly attending church and involved mm-hmm. in their church. And it's the first time that I think I've ever seen that broken down. And what it revealed is that the Christians who are involved in regular church go at least three times a month um, actually have better, more fulfilling lives and marriages than than non-Christians in our culture. But the people who call themselves Christians have the Christian label, uh, uh, but don't aren't regularly involved in Christianity, you know, as, as we want them to be. They actually have worse marriages and less fulfillment than the average person in our culture. Mm-hmm. And so... But in most research and studies, those two groups get lumped together. Yeah. And so then what ends up happening is like, well, Christian marriages are no better than any other marriages. Uh, but it's like, no, you're you're lumping in cultural Christianity and people with yeah. a Christian label and with actual Christians, and it's it's skewing all the statistics. So it's been really interesting, interesting research, and I'm really looking forward to uh, finishing that book and and diving into that a lot more. 
And so uh, it does show that that Christian marriage in which you are actually involved in your local church and Christianity and which comes with accountability and discipleship and Christian values within your marriage does lead to human flourishing. Yeah. And. And it should. Now, that's not to say that marriage is not difficult. And I Absolutely. Think, and I think this is where, because of our redefinition of marriage, especially no-fault divorce, uh, we become weak people. Mm. And, and I mean that in a technical sense. Mm-hmm. Like, like we, we do not have resiliency in relationships anymore. We can find any relationship that we want anywhere that we want it as far as we think. And then we're more lonely than we have ever been in this time in our culture. And so I I tell people marriage is hard uh, because marriage was instituted without sin. And now we're being asked by God and by scripture to continue that institution even while we are in, even while we are affected by sin. Yes. And so, of course, then marriage is going to be difficult. I failed my wife more ways than I can count. If you're watching this, honey, I'm sorry. Um, but well, Trust me, I have to be the hardest person to live with. Just ask, ask Mary. So, you know, yes. Yeah. So, so, and, and she has let me down too. And we've had difficult times in marriage, 15 years of marriage. It's been difficult. And to recognize that it's 15 years, isn't the goal, you know, 50 years, 60 years. That's the goal uh, means you have to weather those storms and you have to recognize that God has called you to something greater. And I think what you pointed out uh, with Nancy Piercy is, is exactly right. Men and women who are involved in their church communities and are married recognize the difficulties of marriage, but recognize the difficulties of life as a disciple anyway. And so might as well go through that with somebody, right? Absolutely. And that's not to say that the church has done a great job with marriage. Absolutely not. We have yeah. so much growth to do in elevating marriage to where it should be, uh, not idolizing it, but, um, biblical marriage in which we actually, you know, submit to one another and die to ourselves and use marriage as a picture of the gospel, which the church hasn't always done with, you know, uh, half of the guys in our churches are addicted to pornography and, you know, divorce and, uh, just it's, we, we've bought into the same cultural values as um, the rest of the culture. And so I see people in the church who are pursuing someone in marriage based on two reasons, based on who am I the most sexually attracted to Mm -hmm. and who gives me all these feelings of happiness. It makes me happy. Even though those sexual attractions and those feelings many times are coming from places of dysfunction, of sin, of lust, of misplaced expectations, of all kinds of idolatry. And, but we still buy into that form of marriage inside the church sometimes, and it leads to disastrous results, which then Mm. discredits Christian marriage um, and is kind of a black eye on the institution of marriage. And then culture looks at that. It's like, well, obviously Christian marriage is no better than any other marriage, Mm -hmm. or sometimes even they think it's even worse uh, because we, you know, can use it to abuse women, to, you know, um, uh, Lord over them with this kind of this patriarchal attitude. Um, and it can be a mess. And so, uh, not that anyone is ever going to be perfect. Um, but we, we have turned a blind eye to the log in our own eye yeah. while we're pointing to the speck in cultures. Yeah, um, ab- absolutely. Eye. Absolutely. And, and I think in a lot of ways we, we have really good intentions a lot of times in, in our churches, uh, but we, we don't spend the time to actually build a good theology around those intentions. Yes. And so uh, case in point, uh, purity culture, purity mm. ring culture, mm-hmm. uh, I think has good intentions. Absolutely. You know, it's good intentions. But one of the things I, I came to realize, because I, I did the purity ring thing and stuff when I was doing youth ministry for a little while, and I came to realize it was a, it was a, a friend of mine that said, do you realize you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and then you're preaching the extra holy gospel of purity? Like you now you've got yeah. to be on a different stage yes. of purity. And I realized I actually am doing that. And so it invites kids to ask the question and it's the wrong question to ask. And it's the question we ask in marriage sometimes too is, well, where is the line for sin? Mm-hmm. Like if I can get up to there, but not cross it, then I'm good. Right. And you can't blame me for things because I, well, I'm not really sinning. 
Uh, and if you look at scripture, that's, that's not anywhere found in scripture where, oh, oh, here's the line. Now we need to be clear on what's sin and what's not. Yes. That's fine. But the better question in marriage and relationships, uh, of all of our relationships is not how far is too far or, or when do I cross the threshold of sin? Because then we start to become the movers of the goalposts, uh, more morally speaking. The better question, in my opinion, is what best glorifies God? What best glorifies God in my marriage? And if I am transgressing that, not only am I hurting my wife, I'm transgressing the the reason that God has called me to to a, be a disciple in the first place. So I have two repentance, two people to repent to, my wife and to to God. If I'm just looking at, oh, how far is too far? If I don't cross that line, but I'm not glorifying God because I'm being arrogant or narcissistic or abusive in a way that I don't think I'm being abusive, uh, then the only person I have to apologize to is God. My wife doesn't. My wife now doesn't matter. Or the only person I have to apologize to is my wife. And now God, st- I'm still okay with God because I didn't technically sin. Yeah, right. Absolutely. We try to get off on technicalities. Yeah, and that's what purity culture did. And piled a lot of shame and guilt on Absolutely. people. But then I see in our world, people who are rejecting purity culture just reject biblical sexuality completely yep. and throw the baby out with the bath water. And it's like, oh, well, that's harmful. So no, uh, we're not going to uh, live by God's standards for sexuality. And that's repressive. And, you know, they, they, we, we live in a culture of personal autonomy. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, so absolutely. So the church has not done itself any favors, but many times cultures also, uh, accusations aren't actually true, Absolutely. but we can't expect culture to have a biblical understanding or a biblical no. view. Yeah. Especially not a post-Christian culture, right? We, we, we understand, you know, as Paul said in first Corinthians where he's addressing sexual sin, he says, I'm not telling you not to be involved with outsiders, uh, with, with, with sexually immoral people on the outside. It's don't do it inside your walls, right? Don't you, you need to have a higher, uh, expectation for the people that are involved in your church. Absolutely. Yeah. So we need to double down on marriage inside the church. Yes. And we need to have higher expectations. We need to hold people accountable. And I hate the word accountability because sometimes it can be just like come across as just very strict, legalistic, yeah. but like, no, we need to disciple one another to mm-hmm. something better so that our marriages are life giving and healthy and reflect Christ and are actually growing and sanctifying us. And marriage is hard and yeah. it should sanctify us because yeah. it reveals so much junk in our lives. It reveals our selfishness. It, it reveals uh, the sin within us and gives us an opportunity to repent and to be sanctified by God's grace. I have pastors and church leaders regularly reach out to me about speaking at their churches and events. If that's something you would be interested in, feel free to go to calibrateministries.com and fill out the contact form. And I'd love to talk to you about what that would look like. Yeah. And so this war on marriage of sexual liberation too, right? Where the promise of sexual liberation is, um, Oh, well, you're, you're, you're repressed, you're sexually repressed. And so go and experience all these sexual things. Um, and it promises freedom, right? That's what our culture is going to do is, uh, if you, if you have a lot of sexual partners, you know, if, if you scroll on, um, any sort of social media app or whatever, the, the, uh, how your body count, the, that, yes. that type of, mm-hmm. it's, it's like, all of a sudden, these statistics of "oh, look, I've I've accomplished this many sexual ex- escapades." Uh, supposedly, all of that's supposed to be freeing, right? Mm-hmm. But what we find psychologically and philosophically is it's actually all very, very constricting. It's it's this weird um, oxymoronic uh, yes. thing that you don't realize. You you think if you do what you want all the time, you're going to feel freedom. Um, but I, I once heard Sean McDowell say this he said asking the question do you think the world christ uh, would be a better place if everybody operated under the christian sexual ethic consistently yes where people who weren't married didn't have sex and people who were married only had sex with their with their wife or their husband and just to drill it down to that now obviously we're not going to get there necessarily but to say 
Think about how the yeah. world would be different. Yeah. Think about if there weren't all these fatherless homes, if there's not pornography, if there wasn't the hookup culture, if mm -hmm. if it wasn't just an option for you and it wasn't celebrated and wasn't uh, on the buffet of things that I could do right now to, to try to satisfy my soul. Think about if there weren't all these kids born out of wedlock. Think about if we actually had nuclear families with a mom and a dad at home. It's like God maybe knew what he was doing yeah. when he designed the family. <laughs> Yep. And so just think about how the world would be so much different if yeah. we accepted that standard and actually lived it out. Yeah, and so it's it really is up to the church to uphold the standard that God set. Yes. I feel like, and, and sometimes I, I feel like I rag too much on the church, um, and the church has been doing a much better job of, of dealing with same-sex attraction, homosexuality. You know, many of them, some of them have gone astray in affirming. Um, uh so, uh, so I don't want to be too hard on the church, but I feel yeah. like one of the reasons why the church has had a hard time speaking in this area of culture is because we've bought into the same lies and the same sometimes perversion of half our you know men are addicted to porn, our pastors are still struggling with porn, um, and uh, and so like we talked about last week, homosexuality is really just the capstone on a culture that is is gone astray with sin and is lusting after one another and is looking to one another for our hope uh, and idolizing, thinking that we can worship a person to find fulfillment. And so then we see perversion just break out in all kinds of ways um, as, as we lose our constraints that God gives us. And one way that I, I, I see that, which I think is... Um, really, really alarming. I've been reading some statistics lately, and there's a study done that showed that 42% of men, and I think it was 35% of women, completely heterosexual men and women, have engaged in anal sex at least once in their life. Wow. And I thought that was absolutely astounding uh, statistic. And I, although it doesn't surprise me a whole lot, because I'm in all these dad groups online and they remind me every day to pray for our culture because I see just the depravity and the hurt mm. and the pain that, that our men are in. But it seems like when the topic of sex comes up so much in these groups, the ultimate goal for so many heterosexual men's sex lives is to have anal sex with their wife. Hmm. It's like, that's like the ultimate, like goal that would fulfill me so much and I was like we we cheer that on and it's like that would be mm. that would be like the crowning moment uh and it's like it's just astounding that this is heterosexual men and that is their goal and so and I think it's yeah. ironic that the church you know um uh we we blast the sodomites which are the yeah. we consider the homosexuals yeah. for engaging in you know kind of the the anal sex uh, because mm -hmm. that's that's the way that the the homosexual men do it and uh and yet that's so much infiltrated now heterosexuality and uh n and not only outside the church but inside the church yeah. i've had men sh filled with shame and guilt to confide in me it's like man like my wife and i we do a lot of anal type play in our marriage like is this wrong and mm. i know that they're feeling some conviction and these are christian men but we buy in the cultural lie that's like well as long as it's two consenting adults so anything i do that's consensual yeah between me and my wife is fine as long as we're consenting and it's like no like we can that that's that shouldn't be the standard. Mm -hmm. It's like, is this holy? Is this glorifying to God? Is this God's created purpose for marriage and sexuality? And I think we, the answer is absolutely not. And so, uh, I, I think there's way more men in the church who struggle with that. Couples that have gone there, uh, but it's it's so taboo and not talked about. But it's so ironic that it's such a problem in heterosexual relationships and marriages and inside the church um, when it's the same perversion that homosexuals are guilty of. Yeah, and I think it's a misunderstanding of the purpose of sex. Sex is pleasurable, but that's not its purpose. And I, th and, and I think God, God shows that in Scripture. Um, God makes sex pleasurable, and I thank God he does. Like, Absolutely. enjoying sex is great. Yes. Um, but the purpose of sex is intimacy um, and procreation. Uh, so 
those things can be accomplished in a holy way. Uh, but when we move outside of God's design for sex, and, and I, I tend to believe that pornography in general is the major driver behind the statistics that you're sharing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't think that's actually kind of a natural bent that, mm. that men are, are looking for over the, hi- over the history of culture. Um, uh, th- there's obviously been sexual perversion as long as, uh, as long as history, as long as history's been recorded. But uh, so I'm not saying pornography is to blame for all sexual perversion, but some of those statistics. It's what's giving the ideas. Yeah, that this is on the plate of what could make me feel good. Yeah, and so our, our culture saying, well, if sex is about pleasure, then find ultimate pleasure. That means everything is negotiable, mm-hmm. right? Um, so we can, you know, finding the right kink or finding the finding the right things to do so that you can get the maximum amount of pleasure is what you should do, even within marriage. And to say, no, no pleasure should be as, as a man, you should pursue the pleasure of your wife. And as a wife, you should pursue the pleasure of your husband in as insofar as it's designed to by God to occur in that intimate moment between you and your wife. Uh, but when we factor in pornography, which is why I'm convicted personally that I I think pornography should be illegal in general. Um, And we can get into that a different time maybe. But when you factor in pornography, it does twist the purpose of sex. Now it becomes about a performance. Absolutely. right. It becomes about me. Yes. And it doesn't become about this other person who I'm supposed to develop a deep knowledge and trust and reliance and commitment that comes in marriage and then that builds healthy intimacy mm-hmm. it be, it goes straight towards the intimacy that isn't really intimacy at all just pleasure yeah and we've removed that from the equation and separated it out from reliance and commitment yeah and that's not to say there can't be creativity within that sexual relationship but i do think there are general boundaries that god has established for us to follow yeah yeah absolutely absolutely i want to end with this um how do we fix this war on marriage? And I really wrestle with what is the church's role and what is the government's role? And many times we blame the government, you know, mm-hmm. the Supreme Court and the, the decision on gay marriage. I think it's been seven years ago now. Yeah. Oh, actually, almost 10. Almost 10. 2014. Yeah. Uh, and so um, so we look at that and we we blame our country we blame politics and sometimes we look to politics um to fix things and that has a role like we should be passing good policy that protects people and leads to human flourishing yet that's not the i don't believe the main way in which we change our culture it's like we need the gospel and so how do we how how do we fit these aspects of life together? We have a civic responsibility, I believe, but we can never legislate our way to holiness. We need to make disciples mm-hmm. in our own life and in other people's lives. And so how do we navigate that? Yeah, so I, I think the government ought to have a stake in marriage. Uh, I don't know how much a government should have the role a role in marriage. I think that would be maybe the way I would, I would put it. Like, the government shouldn't tell um, me how my relationship with my wife should 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 act unless I'm abusing her but that's a stake in marriage so yes. the, I think the government ought to have a stake in marriage because I do think that marriage provides the bedrock institution from which we can actually govern a, a society and culture and that goes back to how we started saying as Karl Marx saw it the disillusionment of that would help bring about a, a revolution um, and I think he's kind of right in that regard so I think the government has a stake in it, but I think the government doesn't is a horrible place to look for for answers for almost anything, um, and and to say well the government ought to fix the court system, th- that might be true, but we also need to operate with the reality of things are the way that they are. Absolutely. And so as the church, especially the local church, uh, we have a duty, like I've said before, to double down on marriage. And to to explain to people, especially young people, I, I know young people who believe in marriage between a man and a woman that are now cohabitating because they want to see if they're sexually compatible before marriage, to say that's that's the church doing a poor job of discipling, um, to say, no, you, you can't do that. I, I've had couples come to me for premarital counseling, living together. Uh, and one of my rules for premarital counseling is um, you're going to move out from now until the marriage. I know that's hard. 
I know that maybe mm-hmm. paying rent is going to be difficult. We'll figure that out together. I'm Absolutely. Not, I'm, we yeah. will, We will. as a, the body of believers, we'll walk alongside you and yeah. help you figure that out. But we want you to start at a fresh place because right now what you're doing is, is, is not glorifying God. Um, and I think the church can operate in a way to say to men, um, you have a duty and a responsibility to your wife and your family. That means you ought not abuse her emotionally, spiritually, or physically. Um, and to a wife, you have a duty to your husband and your family. That means you ought to honor him um, spiritually and emotionally. Um, and to to give people discipleship in a culture that wants to devalue marriage to the point of consenting adults, um, where that can't be the only value, because if that's the only value, then, you know, I've seen... Uh, married couples then go into the swinging lifestyle, say, well, at least yeah. we're consenting. Uh, and they're Christians, right? Yeah, and it's absolutely. like, well, that's, if that's, matter. if that's the only, yeah, the only uh, yeah. value is consent. And that reminds me that, you know, I, I've seen this trend or culture of polyamory recently. Yeah. And I think it, so the difference between polygamy and polyamory is polygamy is one man with multiple wives. Polyamory is a multiple person relationship where these multiple people are are in a relationship together. And I just saw last night in my, one of the dad groups I'm in, someone posted, it's like me and my uh, girlfriend have decided to bring another woman into our relationship for a polyamorous relationship. And uh, we're, we're trying to figure out the details of that. And so when you take away the guardrails and the boundaries and the expectations and the constraint that God gave us that's good and healthy, then anything goes. Mm -hmm. And when you make it just about partnership and what I can get from this and the only constraint is consenting adults, then it's like, oh, yeah, we can then have um, uh, a multiple person relationship. And it doesn't matter if... uh, it's two men and a woman or whatever it is because gender no longer matters in marriage is just about consent, you know? Uh, and yeah. so I think that's, uh, really reveals where our society is at. Yeah. So when we say that marriage is just a loving commitment to somebody, um, well then that's the marriage doesn't have a definition anymore. I should have a loving commitment yeah. to a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a, a loving and sexual commitment to somebody. Right. And, or I, I just want to live a lifestyle with this person. Well, we don't actually have a definition for marriage anymore. What we've done is we've, we've devalued it. And I think the church's role is to build it back up. Yes. Uh, and, and I think the church is, is capable. Absolutely. To do that. And, and as we do so, I, I like what you said is that we have to learn to live in our current reality yeah. in which our society does not value marriage, but that this shouldn't change the way that we do. And yes. we don't have to live by, we should have hope. And I think that we've put too much of our hope in politics at times. Absolutely. And our politicians are failing us. And Mm -hmm. we keep electing some horrible people (laughs) who should not be the model of family values. And it's like, well, then that really shows what we actually believe about family values. If those are the ones that we on the conservative side elect. And so uh, I, I, I think that the last few years has really revealed that our hope is not in politics. And many people who are on our side, seemingly on our side in politics, um, aren't actually Christians mm-hmm. and don't have Christian values. They might have some of the same conservative values, but they don't come a place f- from a place of reverence towards Christ. Yes. And so yeah. we, we should continue to have a voice in the public square uh, and have a voice within politics. But maybe that means like electing people who actually believe in family values. Yeah. Uh, and even though no one is going to be perfect, but also having thriving marriages regardless of what our culture is doing and not yeah. letting culture drive us. Instead, we are influencing culture because we're living differently. Absolutely. And being honest about the difficulties in marriage and, and helping. I, I think there's this lie that uh, my marriage is per like my marriage needs to look perfect or mm-hmm. um, our, our, our churches need to double down on aiding people and healing when they hurt each other in marriage. Absolutely. So Josh, I think that's a great place to end it. I really want to end with saying that like we should be perpetuating a message of hope. It's like we, we can look, we, it's important to look at reality of where our culture is at, but not let that discourage us 
Instead, we can have the hope of the gospel, that we can live differently, that God can redeem and restore. And yeah. even if we're coming from a place of where, where we've been divorced, our marriage is messy, uh, um, that God God is sufficient for each and every one of us, that our hope is not in a person, our hope mm-hmm. is in Christ, therefore we can love a person in a covenant relationship. Yeah, and absolutely. so I, I want to end with a word of hope and encouragement that God gives us everything we need for life and godliness. Absolutely. Uh, even when life gets messy and hard and when marriage is messy and hard. And that is the message that the world needs to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I say the church should double down, because even though there's some people coming from the right side, right side of the aisle, um, there's some Andrew Tate um Pearl Davis, those, those sorts of people saying it's just too risky to say, no, we have a hope that God can overcome those risks. And we need to double down on that because we don't trust society, but we trust our savior. Yes, absolutely. And so I can risk everything because I have everything I need in Jesus. And that's what we're supposed to do. If you're supposed to love your wife as Christ loved the church, then men, you, you, you can't just ignore that call. That means that's a risk. Absolutely. Yep. Amen. All right. So make sure you check out calibrateministries.com, freethinkingministries.com yep. for some great content on apologetics and culture. Uh, and p- please join us next week. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. Check out our website, uh, share with your friends. This is such an important conversation because we need biblical hope in our culture and we need marriage and sexuality that actually embraces God's standard. So thank you for joining us and we will see you next week. Thank you.